engaging with other players. Like I, I, in the rare moments that I go on a forum or something about role playing, it's like, how do I get my players to talk to each other? Like as a, as a, oh yeah, or or to or to or to give space to right? each other, and yeah. that sort of attention to group dynamics is another kind of muscle that a that a improviser has or has worked on. Welcome to Tabletop Talk, where I interview creatives in the tabletop gaming space. I dig into their creative process and their inspirations because my passion is understanding who they are and why they create. Enjoy this interview with Ross Bryant from The Good Place, Stream of Blood, and The Glass Cannon Network. We talk about his origins as an entertainer and a gamer, how his skills as an improv actor translated to the table, and what he believes is the most important skill that makes a great player. Okay, sit back, relax, yes and me, and enjoy my time with Ross. Hello, my name is Sam Dunnewald, and when I'm not breaking down game mechanics on the Dice Exploder podcast, you better believe I'm listening to Tabletop Talk. Howdy friends, Craig here. My guest today is Ross Bryant. Ross is an actor, writer, and a star player in many of my favorite actual plays. You might recognize him from the Good Place TV series, Stream of Blood, the Glass Cannon Network, or my new favorite game show, Game Changer. Ross, welcome to the third floor. Oh, gosh. Great. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, first off, hats off to to John for uh, getting us connected. So uh, Mr. Harper, I appreciate you um, getting me in yes, contact. Indeed. I've been a fan of yours from far away and you have been, your category is is been on my target list for this show. So normally, Ross, I target um, people that do actual plays and people that design games and, you know, talk about that in the tabletop industry. And what I'm finding is that I've, that there's a, a unique person and you're one of them, which is somebody who is a performer, an actor and a comedian who also plays. And, you know, I understand that there's a lot of you out there. <laughs> there's a lot of people that are in your industry that yeah. also plays games. So, I, you know, I've been really looking forward to, to talking about this. And normally how I start my podcast is I go over your gaming origin story. But I feel like you have two origin stories that we want to touch on if we can. So sure. the first one I want to touch on is you as a performer. So at one point, Ross, did you just go, you know what? I think I'm good at this. I think I want to do this. And if so, can we go back to when that happened? Sure. Yeah. I mean, as with most people who get fascinated by this sort of work um, or, or just get, get bitten by the bug, quote unquote, um, sometime in sometime in childhood, like hammy kid gets put in <laughs> play and i i was no exception and um and that was that was a delight that was a delightful experience to me do you remember and, why um, yeah i mean i think so much is just the play of it is so delightful i've always loved like imaginative um you know, make believe playing as a, as a kid, I grew up in a lot of far flung places. My mm. dad worked for the U S fish and wildlife service and we moved around, um, the, the Southeast a lot. So I was frequently the new kid in school yeah. and we were often, um, living in liter on literally the refuges. So right. not just in, in kind of remote places of the South, but on places set aside for their remoteness. And, <laughs> and um, so like um, I lived, for example, for a while on a World War II era army base that had been given to the Fish and Wildlife Service after it was decommissioned. Holy and shit. while its buildings remained standing as like a sanctuary for barn owls, we lived on a street with several houses of which we were the only tenants. Oh my so, goodness. A very kind of like only in retrospect, sort of surreal yeah. <laughs> um, experience. And so you have a lot of time as a kid to kind of uh, have this rich, solitary, imaginative life. And that was so that was such a rich component of my of my childhood. And and it was so fun to kind of give. I wouldn't have put it in these terms then, but it was right. It was, I can kind of in retrospect see that I it was a way of bringing that sort of imaginative play that was just kind of in my room and putting it out 
um, for people and getting a positive response, of course, yeah. like managing the attention of others is so <laughs> it's such a huge part of it when you start, I think. Um, and uh, and and it then kind of did become sort of a way to find a community as you get as right. you become an adolescent. And when I was in later high school and college, I, I stuck with it. And it was in college that I discovered improvisation. In high school, I actually, I went to an arts magnet school for my last year of high school. And I studied with a guy who had been a, who had literally been a student of Paul Sills and Viola Spolin. Oh, wow. Who were okay. sort of the, the, um, some of the foundational folks of, of improvisation. And most of what they did it for was as a way to engage with children and as exercises to for actors to use in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And, but, but I, but I was like, by the time I went to college, I was really steeped in that kind of stuff. And it was in college that I met people who were into, it did performing improvisation at the same time that I was like very, getting really into kind of the artsy side of performance, at least reading about it. I was really fascinated with like a uh, weird experimental theater and, and performance art and all that kind of stuff. And the same sort of, and I would read about this stuff and, and how all those uh, artists aspire to this level of immediacy and 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 uh, engagement with their audience and meeting them where they are, not just being kind of mere entertainment, but really right. engaging in this in this communion, almost like ritual communion with an audience, <laughs> and and kind of divested from all that sort of highfalutin language. That's so much of what improv was for me. It, you, it's so immediate. It's so spontaneous. It's so you, you're in this, the performance is a dialogue with the audience and it was so thrilling and, and fulfilling to me. And to the point that when I was in college, I made up my mind that I wanted to move to Chicago, mm. which at that time was kind of the, the Mecca of, right. of improv and, uh, and study it or just like, or just immerse myself in that scene. And I, and that's what I did. And, and how did um, Chicago go? Talk, talk to me about Chicago. I loved, I loved Chicago so much. I think I arrived there like in the, in the mid two thousands and from the late nineties to kind of the mid 20 teens was this just explosion of that scene. Um, not just improv and sketch, but also, also stand up comedy, a huge scene there. And it was as a member of that, larger Chicago comedy community that I first met Jared Logan as mm -hmm. a stand-up comedian. Um, uh, and so many of my friends, but it was just a, this incredibly vibrant scrappy scene where a bunch of people that, that I recognized myself in these people who had kind of like been, been, bit, been bitten <laughs> wherever they were <laughs> yep. in, in the world had descended on this place where people took this thing that the outside world thought was silly and took it really seriously. Oh, and, that's cool. And, and it was so, so uh, exciting to be a part of that scene and just like, and I was just so excited to perform, have an opportunity to get on stage as much as possible. And those, those first several years were just me just grinding, doing as many shows as I could and like working as a temp in a law firm and just like staying up till three in the morning every night uh doing shows taking classes and and just enjoying being in a in a city having been in such a uh, such a, basically growing growing up in swamps my entire right. life <laughs> there's other people <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> I grow. I grew up in various swamps, so it was nice to move to. <laughs> nice to move to a, a thriving metropolis. So, a couple questions for you, Ross. One is, um, and you hinted at it a little bit. Like, it wasn't easy. You didn't make your first millions in Chicago. Um, I would imagine there were times of you know of great highs and some times of of struggle and lows. Again, looking back on it the same way you looked back on it as a child, you kind of understood and pieced together what was happening to you as a kid. When you look back on those times in Chicago, what do you think got you through to continue? Right. Because I would imagine in that community, there's people that dropped off that that, that couldn't endure. Oh, certainly. Um, it, just the 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 little the little prickle of ambition mm -hmm. and and drive that you've got. Um pushes you through. And also just, I was so invested in the community as well. Just, um, being so in awe of so many of these people that later become your peers and your colleagues yeah. is such a, is such a thrilling experience. Um, 
And it's interesting you, you, when you say like you didn't make your first million, that struggle that I was experiencing, that was everybody. And the unique thing about Chicago at that time and still is that the, the larger entertainment industry presence there is so light mm. um, and even more so then. Um, I feel like it's maybe a little bit more with the 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 Chicago Fire, Chicago Med PD family of products is is all there. But <laughs> in you know, like one or two people on the in the scene would like book a commercial every year, or like maybe <laughs> one person would would uh, would um, on the second CD main stage or something would uh, get cast on Saturday Night Live or be right. hired as a writer. But that was that was about it. It and because of that separation between that Chicago comedy community and, and the capital I industry, mm -hmm. it made the, the community, um, just super experimental and vibrant oh, that's and, cool. uh, and on its own yep. and, there, and people were so into it for its own sake. So many of the people in Chicago were like, I would be on a team with like people like me who'd kind of were, who were, whether or not they'd admit it to themselves were, trying to make a go at being a professional entertainer. And half of the people would be like, I live in Niles, Illinois. I work um, at a flooring company and this is how I have fun. And, th yeah. and that was just, that's, there was no kind of separation between those people. And very often guy at flooring company was the funniest person on the team. <laughs> um, like it, so there was this, an interesting milieu where it was like a kind of working class scrappy scene right. like that. Um, but inevitably your ambition kind of pushes you through and, and also what helped me stick through the hard times or when I, when I would feel discouraged or, um, was every time you feel like a setback, if you just stick with it, I would, I would get the little bit of, um, encouragement or approval that would kind of, um, to put this in gamey terms, level you up somewhat. Sure. Um, another thing about the, the, the relative, insularity of that Chicago scene was there was this kind of like, um, ladder, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. it's like, if I took take classes, maybe I'll be put on a team at IO. If I get put on a team at IO, maybe I'll be on a house team. Um, maybe I could audition for second city. Maybe I could be on the touring company. Second city. Maybe, maybe I could actually get paid to do this. And, and, and you just kind of keep, keep trying and scrapping. And, and I, and I eventually kind of like explored those avenues and it was, it was very, uh, uh, it was really thrilling to get to do that. And eventually I, I was, I was on the touring company. I, I did do the, the main stage and everything. And, and, um, and, and after I had done that for a year, I, I was like, okay, let's, let's try something else. And we uh, <laughs> went to, went to Los Angeles. <laughs> and, and was that literally why did, did you find yourself saying, you know, fuck it, let's go. Or was something calling you, right? Did you get dragged there? Did, was there an opportunity that pushed you over the edge or did you just wake up one morning and go, screw it. I'm going West. I was encouraged. To, I had, I had like kind of people in my ear encouraging me to go. And I also, but it was a, it was a hard, a very hard decision. Like that job at second city is really hard to leave. <laughs> yeah. for, um, it's, it's a very, it's a great job Yeah, and that I, that I got a lot of fulfillment out of. Um, but I think I knew that I, it was so comfortable that if I, I, I needed, I kind of needed to, to go <laughs> maybe yep. rather so that I didn't, so that I didn't feel like too comfortable. Um, and I, <laughs> Where do you think that comes from though, Ross? Cause not a lot of people, not everybody's like that, right? There's a lot of people that will work up to something and go, I'm here. I'm going to coast. I love this. I don't want anything more. You're not that person though. You're like, you know what? Fuck this ladder. I'm going to go start at the bottom of another ladder, you know, 2000 miles away. I mean, it, it helped that I had encouragement from other voices sure. because I have a, I have a huge part of me that's that's very much like let's wrap myself up in the warm blanket <laughs> of comfort and never leave. But but it was nice to have again those those other voices kind of fanning the ember of ambition that I had to kind of to kind of go and try something else. And because I'd had that experience of going from North Carolina to Chicago, I kind of knew that I could do this. I knew that I could. I'd been it, and maybe too even growing up going from place to place like. There is something about starting from scratch in a new place that is somehow familiar to me and and staying in a place too long does feel a little odd. Um, <laughs> sure. And, uh, well, and, yeah. and when we think about you growing up, right, you were very used to relocating, very used to starting over again um, mm -hmm. with the nature of your father. I just you just freaking said North Carolina. Where in North Carolina were you living? Um, my family 
eventually landed in the coast of North Carolina. They're in a uh, they're in the Outer Banks of North okay. Carolina, on the islands on the I'm very in Raleigh, coast. And I go to the oh, Outer okay. Banks all the time, so it's super funny. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, they live in Manio, Manio, oh, North Carolina. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kill yeah, Devil yeah. Hills. I always go to Kill Devil Hills uh, yeah. on vacation. So, oh, that's cool, man. All right. So you, you come out to LA. And I think there's more to that story. Where in this story, though, does gaming come in? So when did you first get exposed to role-playing games? Can we go back to that moment? Yeah. Um, I, I feel like so many of your guests have this moment when like they discover it in childhood and then and then go hard and then step away. And that was very much a adult discoverer yeah. of these games. I never played them as a kid. If I had been exposed to them, I would have loved them, but I just wasn't. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I came to LA and I, I did have kind of a community around like Chicago expats that were kind of in the mix. <laughs> and one of those guys um, played games and he was like, I think you would like to play with us. Come and come and join our group. And that group was Jared and Clint, okay. uh, Jared yep. Logan, uh, yep. Clint Trucks, all the guys who would later f- form Stream of Blood. Stream of Blood, yeah, and guys, both of them have been on the show, so that's very, that's very, very cool. Yes, so they taught me how to interesting do this. And the very first game that we played was a um, was GURPS. So right into <laughs> so the deepest Clint. deep end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Clint, the Clint influence was strong, and um, and um. And I think the first real long kind of campaign that group played is we played a uh, we played Call of Cthulhu. And so that, those are my kind of first experiences. And that was where it really clicked for me. It was like, oh, this is so um, this scratches the same sort of uh, imaginative play itch that I that I love so much that improv um, fulfills so much, but in a different way. And and all the games are so unique and, and they're just yep. such fun ways to explore these imaginative worlds. And I love that. And then we played a really long Dungeons and Dragons campaign that went online when the pandemic hit. And we committed to playing on Zoom all the time. And I think it was around that time that Jared and Clint and Brian, the, the triad that started right. the stream of blood, um, we're like, hey, if we're all playing online anyway, let's just stream these games and be. And as someone who is uh, regularly in the rotation who didn't say no to their emails, I, <laughs> I, did, a, I did a lot of those games. Um, be, and, and it had a lot to do with like because I get so much fulfillment out of improvisation and live performance. Right. The, the pandemic was really emotionally tough for me. Like I got. I had to really grapple with how much of my own sense of self-worth is tied up in the I applause bet. of strangers. Yeah. And, and like, and it was really, really tough. And doing actual plays over the course of pandemic with stream of blood was such a, such a release valve. Yeah. It, it really, really saved a part of my brain. So I, I can't thank him enough. I would imagine too, and tell me if I'm wrong here, Ross, it would also, you get the community piece that you like so much, right? Where you had, you're yeah. able to bounce and listen and kind of what you had a little bit in second city, but now you can sit like where you are now in, in a room and be able to do it over zoom. Um, I would imagine that'd be impactful. It's great. Um, yeah. yeah, I just love, and I love how it, these games, it's, it's a lot of the same muscles of theatrical improvisation a lot of the skill, almost all of the skills translate. Right. But the kinds of stories that you tell are so different and are not relying on, on, on comedy and are, and you get to stretch out in a character for so much longer that as a, as a performer, it's, it's such a interesting and unique way of telling a story and a unique way of inhabiting a character and a unique way of, several different imaginations all yeah. coming together to build something that's more than the sum of their parts. Yeah, it's so true. Like one of the things that I love as a player, uh, I'm often the GM, but as a player, one of my favorite things to do is, is to have a sketch of a character, right? Don't, I, I'm not the four page backstory guy, right? I'm a like th- three sentences guy jumping into that skin and discovering the character that you're playing and it, that that I don't know if that's anywhere else. Right. Because uh, it, it, it's long form, like you said, you get to do yeah. it over time and other people influence it as well. 
that's precisely the 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 that's such an improviser way of describing it like you go from a character perspective if you're if you're doing a sort of long form improvised piece where where you you were like I'm going to I'm going to try some characters tonight. It's not like you go on stage having pre-planned a right. bunch of stuff. That's death. You you go on stage and the most you give yourself is like I'm a guy who squints. <laughs> I'm going to go on stage and I'm a I'm a guy whose voice is a little higher than mine. And we find out the reasons for that. Oh, it's so cool. As we as we discover it with our with our partner and and that's exactly how you create characters or how I, how I like to create yeah. characters in, in these shows. So um, I've only been exposed to you playing, you know, the games that I've seen online. Right. Um, so I have followed you and your journey through stream of blood over to glass cannon, uh, watch you on my TV now on uh, the game shows <laughs> and stuff. Mm-hmm. I, before we break and we uh, go to the next segment, of all the games, starting with Clint, who loves GURPS, of all the games that you've been exposed to, is there one in particular or some or a style of game? What's what's clicked with you the most as you've played several different systems? The ones I mean, I truly do. I'm 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 very promiscuous when it comes to these <laughs> games. I'm, I like to I like to meet them on their terms and, and yeah. try to enjoy them. But I feel like the ones that that are most simpatico with me are the ones where you can really dig into a a character and that's why call of cthulhu and blades in the dark might be my favorite ones yeah that i've that i've had the opportunity to play um because you can really sit down and let let this character develop so richly over time with with call of cthulhu because it is so narrative focused um and i'm also really into historical fiction so i do love the playing in these different eras is so compelling to me um and 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 putting a character under extreme duress That's like that key. like that game yep. does brings out so many interesting facets of them and because the game of call of cthulhu isn't a power fantasy in the way that some other games are you you get to play characters that are all too human yep um and and i i really like that it's it doesn't the game so the game doesn't involve it's not character as kind of wish fulfillment <laughs> Um, it, uh, like the first call to the character I played was a creaky old, uh, Polish American antiquarian. <laughs> and so no, not necessarily the, what, what your layman thinks of when they're like, you're getting together to play role-playing games and roll dice and you're playing a, a weird, uh, a weird old academic. <laughs> okay. Um, you do you, <laughs> but, and, and with blades in the dark, the way, especially those, uh, the downtime mechanic yeah. works where you just have this whole phase of the game where you deepen your, your character and, and build out their little personal world and story. Um, it puts, it, it empowers everyone at the table to be a GM and to, and to paint the world together. And, and I, I, I love that. That's very, very cool. So guys, the Insider Insight series allows me to sit down with designers, developers, artists, writers, and creators and learn how they approach their work. I try to understand their process, inspiration, and the methods for crafting their creations. We've got a lot to talk to Ross about when we get back from this break. I want to find out where the concentric circles fall when you're a performer who games and a gamer who performs. We'll be right back. everyone, this is Zoe, co-host of the Mediculum Podcast, here to tell you about our new Kickstarter project, launching June 1st of this year. The Marginal Worlds Kickstarter is a deck of 50 easy-to-play magic items pulled directly from medieval manuscripts that you can play in any TTRPG. So if you're looking to dazzle your players with magic items once hidden for centuries in ancient tomes, sign up on Kickstarter or themediculumpodcast.com to check out sample cards, playtest them yourself, and bring the magic to your table on June 1st. Uh, Ross, before we went live, I kind of talked about how I've had this need to talk to people. Honestly, it was I think it was talking to Jared when Jared came on the show that made me realize that uh, that there was a community of gamers that were also in the entertainment industry. And talking with Jared, I realized um, that there's there's a, there's interesting overlaps there. 
And what I'm hoping to do with you is, and we talked about a little bit there, but, and you're a great test case. Jared is not a great test case because he was a gamer from, from day one. Right. Um, whereas you are very interesting because this is something that was newer to you than improv and, and, you know, comedy and things. So I guess putting you back in the seat when you sit down with Clint and everybody to play GURPS, which God bless you. Um, <laughs> what tools did you have that were immediately available and ready to use when you started playing the game? So what do you think you as a new gamer, but as a performer brought to the table that just like, oh, shit, this works. I'm going to pull this out of my bag. Yeah. Um, like I said, I feel like the improv skills translate one to one practically across the board. So part of it is just being really comfortable sliding into the voice of a character. And by the voice, I don't necessarily mean like doing a voice, right. but what they're taking a, a group of numbers and stuff and interpreting that as a, as a way of behavior. Like mm -hmm. what is, what is, what do all this imply about what this character wants, what their point of view is and what's, what's fun for me about that. Once you have the, the if the sheet is kind of the suggestion do I, to use a well-worn improv phrase, yes. And that, but I also, right. if this, then what that <laughs> to, to build out the, the character. Um, I think as a player too, who was a performer first, I think maybe the most important skill is listening. Mm. It's, I mean, another thing that you'll hear in any improv class that you take, especially early on, is that in improvisation, listening is more important than talking. You'd think it would be quips and, and funny things to say, but it's way, way more about a level of extreme active listening and trying to make everything that your partner says important. Attend to oh, what they say. Oh, that's an interesting way to put it. Yeah. Attend to what they say in, in great detail and, and build on it. Mm -hmm. Not just in a way where I, where I kind of yes and it, but I maybe am reading more into it than you even implied, but then you will of course accept my interpretation of what you say. And we, and we build this thing together very rapidly. Um, and it's only by paying deep attention that you can do things like call back something in a 45 minute show that was said a uh, half an hour ago. Um, and so engaging with other players, like I, I, in the rare moments that I go on a forum or something about role playing, it's like, how do I get my players to talk to each other? Like as a, as a, Oh yeah. Or, or, to, or to, or to give space to right? each other. And yeah. that sort of attention to group dynamics is another kind of muscle that a, that a improviser has or has worked on that can both kind of be chalked up to listening where am I talking to too much so that mm -hmm. I'm sucking all the air out? Um, and if so-and-so hasn't engaged, well, rather than judging this moment and being like, why haven't they talked, be the solution and engage them and draw them into the, into the conversation. Can we dig into that a little bit, Ross? Cause I think that's a really important point. And it's something that I, um, I, I think that our hobby would be better if more people did that. So can you think of um, techniques or or things that you do to say, you know, Craig's over there being he hasn't really talked a whole lot in this scene or in, in this, you know, the last 20 minutes we've been playing and I, I can help with that. Like, can you give me an idea of what you would do or what you do do? Sure. I mean, I would in a, in a gaming table situation, if if the if a character but but after you played for a little bit, you should have a sense of like what characters kind of deals are your own sense of their kind of bullet points about what a character wants, the filter with which they view the, the, the game world. Um, and so like one of the simplest things might be just like asking them, like, I mean, very simplest is like, what, what, what do you think about this thing we just experienced or maybe offer, offer a take. It's like, I bet your take on this is this. Am mm. I right or wrong? Um, give them the opportunity to either agree with you and start a conversation that way or to disagree with you and start a conversation that way. Um, uh, or just, and it doesn't, and and I can be very di like dialogue heavy. I realize not everybody plays like that. Not everybody likes to 
really, you know, do an accent or whatever. But you could do the same thing out of character, kind of narrativizing. Um, another another thing that you that that is is helpful. There's two levels in in improv. We're often taught to play characters that like each other, even if even if the characters are in conflict, if they if they don't like each other, then why don't they just leave? And then there's no scene. Right. There has to be something that kind of glues them together, even if they're they're butting heads. Yep. And I feel like a a, a party kind of it, it's helpful. So it's true. helpful if it has that kind of dynamic. If the characters um, have some level of mutual respect, and if nothing else, you can fall back on that. I think one of the most fun things you can do as a character in a game is to give another character a compliment, like <laughs> like. Um, to confess, like in, in Cthulhu, I feel like I, I, I find myself doing this a lot where like my a character will be like, I contended with that situation terribly. I'm falling apart. I'm going mad. Um, I wish I was as strong as you. I oh, wish I was. So I wish I was as helpful as you. If only I could be more like you. Help me. <laughs> like, um, oh, God. And, and uh, there, I have a friend who says that, like, if you're ever stuck in an improv scene, one thing you can always say that always works is I have a confession to make. <laughs> <laughs> and and if you kind of look at the the spirit of that, if you just confess something to another character, yeah. it can draw them uh, them in. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be something about your weakness or their heroism. Sure. But if you confess something about personal, then you, what you've done as a character is what you've done as a player is say that this is a safe space to talk about what is personal to my character. And I'm offering you the chance to, to, to do the same. Um, and if I, I'm sorry, I'm going on so long, but no, I, I'm kind of working dude. this out on the fly. The characters like each other, but, but also behind that, the players like each other, right? The actors like each other. Yep. There's another sort of well-worn phrase in improv is treat each other like poets and geniuses and your players will rise to the occasion. Um, before every show, we always like, you know, pat each other in the back and say, I got your back. And it's all very like touchy feely theater school, cool, but there, it's, it does really set a vibe. Yep. There is something, there is something really um, protective and kind about walking on stage, knowing that like in the event that something goes weird, like you will be there to help me. I'm there to help you. Yeah. And the you, same you can't sort fuck of, it up, right? Yeah. And, and in games, you know, the stakes are, the, and as in improv, the stakes truly are quite low. <laughs> like, um, it's, we're not, we're not splitting the atom here. Um, but if you go in, if you go in just like willing to respect everybody and respect everybody's choices, then, then things are going to be very smooth. And just having that attitude, that got your back kind of attitude, um, amongst each other as players, just lets the communication flow. It's, it, I think that's a huge lesson. So one thing that I've always had in place, Ross, with my tables, as I said, you know, you guys can make your characters. Um, we'll figure it out. I want to do, I always make sure we do it as a group for the type of stuff that you're talking about. But the, I have like, I have the one rule, which is I don't care why, but all of you trust each other. So you figure out why that is, but everybody at this table trusts each other. Their characters trust each other. Now you can build whatever the hell you want after that. And, and it's very much tied to what you were just talking about there. Um, when you think about, so, I mean, I'm trying to think, what are you in year four playing year five? How many years yeah, are we? I, year f I mean, I, I played a little bit preceding, preceding <laughs> stream of blood, the, the COVID, uh, pandemic <laughs> this yeah. is the way in which I order all this in my <laughs> brain. Um, yeah. So yeah, the about times. six, exactly. Um, the, what was, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, six years in six, seven years in. Do you, and you may not, right? This is not a, this is a, this is a classic Craig shitty question. Um, is there a gaming moment that's really burned into your brain where you're just like, when I think about, dude, why are role-playing games fun? Someone says it to you, you go, let me tell you about this time. Do you have one of those? I have so many. Like, of well, yeah, it's the hard part, right? <laughs> yeah. Can yeah. you pick I've, one for me? I have, I have so many. Um, I mean, and I'm, and it's split too between home games and stuff that happen on streams. <laughs> but, whatever, whatever clicks. You you understand what I'm asking? Of course. Um, 
I think uh, it just in that in that D and D game that we played at home, just uh, there was a moment when we were facing off against one of the one of the many one of the many uh, horrible evils that we were we were trying to dispatch, and it looked as though it was going to be curtains for our gang, and um, and just something happened where I, where where you get to play the hero, where I just really yeah. like a. a villain has a knife to one of one of the player characters throats they're they're about to die it looks like it's it's done and and then you polymorph your friend into an earthworm grab him with a mage hand and you save the dang day (laughs) um i i will truly remember that until my dying day as i'm as i'm like in my fugue state in my deathbed whispering about dorney and dawnbreaker and my and, my, and the hospice nurse is like, okay, Mr. Bryant, go oh, walk into funny. the light. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, we turned the oxygen off, sir. Yeah, um, yeah. But also, like, that's one. But yep. I mean, another huge one is just uh, the way that, um, the way that our, uh, there was a sort of a storyline in our Blades in the Dark campaign on, on the glass cannon when a, a character I was playing got possessed by the the ghost of the deceased lover of one of the other characters, and this possession corrupted them and and made them a little deranged. Um, uh, it sounds quite mad when I say it out loud, but I promise this all makes sense in context. Go back and watch Haunted City on Glass Cannon. Um, it's so good. But there were so many moments in that journey where, um, where, uh, uh, especially towards the end when it was like player versus player. And I, and this, I don't think contradicts my love each, like each other. Not at all. These characters did like each other too much. Yep. <laughs> and the, and all of this was very, uh, only possible because the players trusted each other so well and were invested in telling a compelling story. Um, and yeah, when, when all that reached its denouement, I was like, it's like, wow, uh, what an incredible tale uh, that, that just lives in our memories. Now. It does too, isn't it? It's amazing. And one of the things that I love doing on the show, Ross, is asking people stuff like that because I can, and I've watched it with you, I watch people go back in time and relive such a vivid moment that, that that's, that's on a loop in the back of your head. Yeah. Um, that's the, you get, you make, I, I get into how this stuff, I'm, I'm just fascinated in occultism. Oh, okay. As a, as a, as a, as, a, as an interested party, not a practitioner. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and there are all these concepts like paracosm, like a, I don't know what a, that is. a paracosmos, a shared imaginative world like wonderland mm-hmm. or, um, uh, that is a, a space that exists in, in your imagination that is the product of several imaginations oh, so or, or an egregore, a, <laughs> uh, a, an entity of imagination that is brought to life by people's imaginative faculties. That's what we're doing. Yeah. And, if the, and, and if it can be said that these imaginative worlds of ours have reality, that they are in a way spells <laughs> that we are casting, that they, they have they are real in yeah. that they inhabit our memories in as profound a way as our daily life goes into our memory. And in, in one the way thing it, I feel like is, I, I, yeah, I agree. And one thing I think is unique to the hobby compared to other gaming is you really give a shit. Mm-hmm. Like you really care. Um, and I've had moments at a table where I'm like, this, this really, this like, this matters to me. Like what happens next matters to me, good or bad. It, it totally matters to me. So Russ, you come into the hobby. Um, was there any friction? So was there anything that you bounced off at first or struggled with when you had this shared imaginative improvisational experience at a table that was just different enough? It wasn't the same thing that you were doing in Chicago. Was there anything mm-hmm. that you struggled with or was it all smooth sailing? It's pr- it was pretty smooth sailing because, you know, I'm working with people, especially I was so lucky in that when I started, I was in such good. And yeah. it was a strong first group. dude. Hands. Yeah, got real lucky, really lucked out. Uh, Jared and Clint are very patient and uh, 
and kind folks who are willing to teach a newbie how to, how yep. it all worked. And, but I'll say, I, I don't know, this is a bump necessarily, but as an improviser, sometimes I can get impatient in these games, mm. the way the, um, sometimes the mechanics can feel frustrating if they, if they just kind of feel like they're killing the momentum yep. or I'm, it's like, I want to get on with telling the story. Why do right. we have to, why do we have to get bogged down in, are you 45 feet from so-and-so? <laughs> like, um, and sometimes I feel that way. Yeah. Often, often I, especially if the GM has the right attitude and everyone is all kind of on the same page, those moments of, especially in the, in the heat of a combat where you're, where you're keeping a leg in the narrative space mm -hmm. and you can dip out into the table space. That's so much a part of it is, is, is that pivot um, of like, and it's, and it's a weird skill that you, it is that, that you just kind of pick up, but like yep. switching into character voice and repainting the scene and you hear the music in your, in your mind's ear to, okay, it's, Pennies on a dry erase board and, um, okay. Who wants a spin drift? And, uh, I think, okay, I am, I am 20 feet for him. So, so, okay, great. He is within, he is within, um, like ray of frost range. And, like, um, and I've got a feet that does this. If I roll yeah, this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> and if everybody's kind of down to clown, that's, that's fine. But, um, if I feel as though, in those moments where I feel as though the system almost is like working against yep. my own sense of like momentum and propulsive urge to get this story told that can be, that can sometimes feel a little frustrating. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of, of system matters. Um, and, and it's where I struggled with D and D is that I just, it was just too much mechanics for me. Cause I, I share your thing. Whereas with blades, the mechanics kind of slip in, help us figure out what's next and they slip away, which, which I love. Now, you've been doing this for five years as a gamer. Uh, well, first of all, do you consider yourself a gamer? I, I feel like that's stolen valor, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, feel like I haven't been in the war. I haven't been in the wars long enough. Um, I, I'm, I'm with people who've been doing it for so long. I'm, I don't know if I count. Um, I'm also put, such a... Put that D20 down. You didn't earn a Ross. <laughs> yeah, damn right. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Get that. I'm going to yeah. steal that stolen valor line just so you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but seriously, but do you, like, do you consider yourself a gamer? I consider myself a T. I, I will tell people I am into TTRPGs because it's kind of exclusive to that. I'm not a big board game player. Yeah. I'm not a big card game player. I'm not a big video game player. I'm, I'm really just into this stuff. It's not for. I, I've got a little bit of interest, but I'm I, there are only so many hours in the day. <laughs> True. <laughs> Yeah, I'm 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 kind of committed to this one. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I'm if if people are willing to extend me the the title, I'll take it. We, I put the sword on both shoulders. You are mm -hmm. now a gamer. So I guess what I'm wondering, because we've really got to think a strong sense, Ross, of how you the skills that you came to the table with influenced how you played and how they translated. Has anything come back? So have you now found when you go on an audition or when you're doing improv or doing something not at a gaming table, is there anything that you've taken back from gaming? Yeah, I think, and I hope it's a good habit, but I, I've, I just felt myself become so much more of a verbal performer. Ooh, how so? Being confined to the boxes on like a Zoom or a StreamYard call. Yeah. And we're doing really when I describe when I describe what I do as a actual play streamer to an improviser has no idea what that is. I just say like we it's basically an improvised radio play. We do mm. improvised radio plays and which is pr that's pretty much what it is with with the dice and the mechanics and all that yep. that that can drive that you get into the weeds of that. Then a, a layman's eyes begin to glaze <laughs> over. <laughs> but. But because of that, it's it's fundamentally an audio medium. I, I I got used to, I think, really leaning into words and wordiness and 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 I got really confident more so with like going on at length. 
Mm. and and being able to like kind of set up and follow through on a long train of thought in words. And I think there's times where that's really valuable. And I think there's times I could probably write it in sure. and in, and I've noticed that I, I became much more of a verbal um, performance, like comedy improviser. When I, when I went back to the stage, um, like I just felt so much more confident um, riffing in that gear. Yeah. And I'd like to, I'd like to become more embodied, mm. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe I need to do LARPs and that'll, <laughs> that'll, that'll help. You didn't think you were a dork now. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I make jokes about LARPs. I, um, that has like, so for a lot of gamers that play like magic, the gathering and board games and stuff, they look at role playing games and go, no, 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 no. I'm a geek, but I'm not that geek, right? That's a whole nother level. And then you have the people in the TTRPG community look at LARPers and go, oh, no, 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 that's that's too far. But actually, LARPing is actually pretty cool. Um, I've been exposed to it more and more. Um, I'm not I, I, I dip my toes there a little bit, but a lot of my friends are really into this one that that happens outside of outside of L.A. And they've Tell coaxed me. me to do it many times. It's called Twin Masks. I've never done it, but but a handful of my friends who are who straddle the game improv divide as I do are very into this LARP. And what do you know about it? um, Gosh, it, when they begin talking about it, it's so lore dense that I'm like, uh, (laughs) okay, (laughs) it's, it's, um, I, I'm now conveying this to you like third hand, but I think it's, it's a society of, I think it's people who are all ghosts like okay. their town is are they, they they're maybe all in a sort of afterlife there are distinct cultures that they're all members of um people do ter- every every night there's an attack there oh, people interesting. do turns being being the uh being the villains but um they have their old little town and little culture and like uh there's there's apothecaries and musicians oh, cool. and traders and all kinds of folks i i don't know that's that's about the extent of it but yeah my 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 friends zach reno and sarah kaplan and mary lou love it <laughs> love it that's so cool yeah if you're like me too like i don't care what somebody's into i love talking to people that are into shit like yeah. if you if you want to if you want to like really see me at my happy place it's me finding somebody who loves something and getting them to talk about it because that passion about I don't care if it's about hunting knives or LARPing or whatever it is, when you can engage somebody and get pull that out of them and that that just enthusiasm is, is pretty damn cool. What is nerdery if not like just like highly specific enthusiasm? <laughs> it's like, it's it's just it. it's so true. <laughs> yeah. And and if 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 a nerd is ridiculed, it's because they're too enthusiastic and passionate about a thing that someone does not understand. <laughs> and and god bless sometimes we oh, find god our bless. people yeah i um i'll tell you what weirds me out is like uh, and I, this happens to me is where i meet somebody who doesn't have any hobbies and, yeah. and it, not that there's anything wrong with them but that's so foreign to me because hobbies are such a big part of my life that i'm like like well so then what do you do do you just like I work <laughs> i uh-huh. don't understand I, I, I see so many um, not to get political but there some like contemporary like cultural neuroses that are out there are like people, people falling down internet rabbit holes and, and becoming believers in, shall we say odd or fringe beliefs. I look at that and I'm like, this is a hobby to them. It's this, what, what I'm getting in a way they are also engaging with a communally built imaginative world. <laughs> and it is, it's the same thing. I've never couched it that way. And I could not agree more. Like if you think about flat earthers, like you take you take a step back and you go like what the, what 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 are we even talking about? But but it is it's they find a community they find things to engage in to dig into to discover and you know uh, the, the Earth's still a globe but I get it yeah, right yeah, I, yeah. I get what they're doing there. <laughs> yes yes so maybe good to kind of step back in these moments and 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 it uh, and just take take stock whether the community and hobby you're a part of is benign and yeah and the right ways in, in the ways in which it can per- perhaps reform. Well, and, and I think about like QAnon was the same way, too, where yeah. you had and it wasn't a coincidence that it happened during COVID, right, where you no, had no. people that were starving 
to be an insider and starving to be part of a community and and things like that. Um, Certainly. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not making excuses for anybody, but the, there is there is that part, I think, of that. I couldn't agree more. For sure. So guys, we're going to take one more break and uh, I want to pick Ross's brain. I want to talk to him about playing and I want to talk to him about it specifically in actual place. So we'll be right back. Are you looking for a D&D podcast for the dark side? Something more like Game of Thrones and less like Monty Python? Tale of the Manticore is part dark fantasy audio drama, part solo D&D RPG. There's no plot armor here. The dice make all the important decisions. Join me as I resurrect the excitement, wonder, and emotion of old school D&D. Made for a mature audience, Tale of the Manticore is both a fiction and a game. It's the story where chaos rolls. You made an interesting distinction, Ross. You said, you know, Craig, do you want my moment at the table or my moment on stream when I was talking about like big moments? And those are those are two different things, right? It um I I there's a huge overlap between playing in an actual play and then, you know, playing at home, but there's there's very things that are distinct. Um so I guess my first question to kind of start things off, do you watch other actual plays? So in the process of performing and being a part of actual plays, have you then found yourself looking to other actual plays and, and enjoying those? I have to admit, I am not a big watcher of actual yeah. plays. Um, I'll, I'll occasionally dip in, but, but, but I'm not a, not, not much. The one that I really kind of listened to almost all of it was the first season of the adventure zone, mm. which was really great. I it really was. liked it. And that was before I was playing D and D. So in a way it kind of taught oh, me how that's interesting. So I was listening, I was listening to it in a way oh, because I was wait, curious. Wait a second. Wait a, second. How, wait a minute. This is before you're playing. So what, what brought you to adventure zone then? I think I, I was, line. what was it? I, I'm a, I was listening to another podcast that I liked that was just a comedy podcast mm -hmm. and there was an ad for it. Oh, on interesting. There. And it, one of the rare moments that a podcast ad actually got someone <laughs> to listen, but I, it did because I was curious about, about D and D it was something that I was kind of fascinated in from afar. Got just it. Like the rare moments that I'd kind of glimpsed it, um, over the course of my childhood or I was like, this seems like something I'd really like, but mm -hmm. I don't, it's also just seems so complicated. I've described it as like, Ooh, I want to, I want to engage in this like a, like I said, imaginative play, this, this world of, of magic and mystery and wonder, but first fill out a W2 like, um, <laughs> it's, is how I describe it. But, um, and so it was a way of just kind of engaging with it and being like, what is this really? What does this actually look like when people play this game it was part of the reason I listened. And, um, and then I just got caught up in the, in the story and the dynamic of the, of those guys. And, um, but that was really the last one that I, that I listened to in, in its entirety. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to put this the right way, Ross, because I don't get the impression that you don't enjoy it because you, you, but, but it does, do you have a sentiment? I'm trying to figure out how to do this, Ross. Um, Oh no, I'm a hater. I'm a hater. You guys, you should see the signs behind him, the posters, <laughs> yeah, he's got yeah, yeah. critical role scratched up with, with uh, <laughs> knives and blood. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Matt Mercer, is like an effigy behind him. Um, yeah, this is the. I want to. I want. I want uh, actual plays to have an have an analog to the Kendrick Drake beef. We need to. We, we, need to, we need to bring the fire back to the scene. Come on. All right. So here, I think it's I figured out how culture. I'm going to ask you this question, Ross. If I told you tomorrow you were going to come across an actual play that you were like, "Holy shit! It's all I want to do is watch this thing." What do you think would what do you think would be true of that actual play? So what would it take to draw you in and make you sit and watch an actual play? What are elements? The relationship and rapport between the players um, that they're that I get the sense that these are people who are, are friends and that their dynamic is is compelling and supportive. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one of the things that's that people seem to love so much about like the the early glass cannon is yes. that those guys are are such are such pals and 
however much they roast each other, it's all from a place of love. And it's yep. the way that you hang out with your, your friends and that sort of vibe of like, I'm kind of the unseen friend at the table, just kind of listening in. I, I love that. Um, I don't care as much as I like me. I don't, I don't need a lot of like peripheral bells and whistles. I don't need post-production. I don't yep. need minis. I don't need a crazy set or costumes. Um, just the, just people all kind of on the same page and listening to each other and committed to telling a fun story together. And, and that's it. That's really it. Which it's, it's what I'd want out of an improv show too. Right. I don't really, I, I, another thing that I, I don't watch a ton of improv shows. Oh, that's interesting. Like, okay. Like, um, I used to a ton. Yeah. And, but, um, I, I perform in them almost every week. Right. But I, I'm not, I, I rarely sit down and watch one sometimes, but, but when I'm in it, when I do what, 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 what delights me is just the same stuff. Seeing yep. people who have a good rapport where they, they, these are people on each other's side they have a sense of what they want to do. Um, it's not just like, we're going to go out there and we're going to do a montage. It's like, we have a goal in mind. Right. We're maybe a little ambitious about what we want to do. And, um, and that just on the same pagedness is, is what I'm after. So, so we hinted, we hinted at what a spoiled brat you are as far as the quality mm -hmm. of people that you've had a chance to play with. Right. You didn't, know. you didn't have that shitty older brother next door that, that you learned D and D with that many, many people that have gamed for a long time have, um, and, and understand that your answer to this question in no way is creating a hierarchy in any sense. Uh, if we had four hours, we could talk about every GM that you've played with, but I would, <laughs> I would love to know, um, and we don't even have to name the person, but what are things that you have had GMs do that really make the game for you? So are there things that you have had a chance to watch? Because you've now played with several very good GMs at this point. Oh, yeah. So what lucky. Are, what are things that you've seen GMs do that just really turn things on for you? I mean, I'll name names. I think Jared Logan is one of the best in the game, baby. Could not agree more. And... <laughs> He has, he, he's so good at it in a way that does, this is not damning with faint praise or like a back end compliment that doesn't call attention to itself. Yep. He, he's such a gracious DM. And when I talked about how I can sometimes be kind of a motor mouth, like used way too many words, um, is how I will critique myself after the fact. I feel like Jared is so economical in a way that lets your imagination run more wild. He gives you just enough for you to imaginatively engage, but not so much that you feel swamped right. by his, his world, where you get the sense that you, you, you can't touch anything because he is so delicately set up. Great way to put it. Yep. The, the world. Um, he plays uh, NPCs. Um, with a lot of integrity and humor. And he manages that balance of toggling back and forth between game voice and around the table voice really, really well. Um, in a way that's really light. He has a very light yeah. touch. Yep. Um, so that when you play with Jared, you always have that sense of like, we're, we're just friends around the table, no matter how heavy it gets. Um, but he'll let it get heavy. He will. He will, and, uh, which I love. He'll let you sit and sit in a dark place, which is really, or an emotional place, which is really cool. And it always feels earned. It does. And one of the biggest things I've learned from him as a GM is to give space. He does a great job with that, yeah. which is just give, let him go, let give him space. And, and he's comfortable with silence. And yes. it's, it's so, so counterintuitive, cool. right? Right. Like the, as as a, the DM, I've GMed um, for friends and man afterwards you're just like horse because you just realize i talked so much and jared is such a master at like being comfortable with silence mm -hmm. and letting you fill fill that with your imagination he's so gracious in that way um yeah a troy a lavalley has a lot of the same he does a lot of the same vibe he um and a thing that troy has done so wonderfully in our call of cthulhu game on the glass cannon for those of you, if you don't know, uh, both Jared and Troy are uh, GMs on the Glass Cannon. 
Troy is one of the founders. And um, we play this Call of Cthulhu campaign called, that goes under the title, Time for Chaos. And he's playing through a module, one of the most famous modules, Masks of Nyarlathotep. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I mentioned listening before. Listening and recall is so much a part of that I got your back. When when I say that, I mean, I'm not just going to pay attention to you. I'm going to listen to everything you say like it really matters so that I can remember stuff you said later um, and and bring it up. That's such a, a gift if a player will do that. But Troy is a master at this, of integrating little choices that you make off the cuff into this wider world and making them really important. Yep. Um, so he takes your, your imagination seriously, and you're not confined to the perfect story that he is telling. Oh, He's God. taking the little, just the little offhand comment that you made and integrating it and bringing it back in a way that, that uh, has real uh, stakes. It does. And, and, and real impact. And, and what's so cool about it is that, and is, I, I love that you brought both, both of them, uh, Jared and him in the same breath. They're very different GMs, mm, yeah. but they share so much, which is, which is something that I think is something for GMs that are listening. You should watch both of them run games because they, they don't run games the same way, but they have yeah. a very similar set of skills. Similar set of skills. I, I think one way they really diverge and it's not a good or bad thing. No. Jared is fast yes <laughs> he's like me i think one of the reasons i can be impatient as a player is because i'm used to jared as my gm and he trucks he, he does not fast. Like take a breath <laughs> no he, want, he wants to go to the next scene wants to wants to go here uh cut the cut the fat let's go let's go yep. let's go and um i i love that mm-hmm. and because because we we get a lot more story in a in in packed into those two hours and troy will sit and let something play out and that also is great because uh, when you're so when you're with Jared, you have the license to to play your character like a stolen car. Yep. <laughs> Drive your character like a stolen car, as I think John Harper says. Yep. Um, and when you're with Troy, you have license to really deepen your character and you have and you're given license to like, I can just have a conversation. This doesn't all have to be. Um, uh shoe leather detective work trying to find right. the tentacle monster me and Nora Ibrahim's character can just have a conversation and it'll deepen both our characters and whatever we say is being listened to by Troy to be weaponized oh it, it is so god it's so true it's so true then that and that is hands down the biggest thing I've learned from watching Troy at work it, it, is is and you said it it's 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 the stakes and it by listening and bringing stuff back choices, m- making the players realize your choices matter and, and amplifying that by bringing them back and have them impact the world and have the world react to those is big. So, you know, often when we talk about gaming, Ross, we glorify the GM. Um, I want to talk about players a little bit. Um, I could talk again. I could talk to you for four more hours about you as a player, and I'm not going to. Um, you, you got a big enough head. I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> mm-hmm. What are some players that you, because you've not only have you had a chance to play with some amazing GS, but you've had a chance to play with some amazing players. And I think Tell about, about it. think about players that you've played with that are very, very much veterans um, of, of the gaming. And then you've got people like, you know, Abu Bakar, who's was newer than even you were to yeah. this right and just destroyed like took over the entire stream uh with, with with his ability can you talk to me about some players that had an impact on you as a player where you watch them and go oh i forget i'm playing because i'm too busy watching you yeah oh man that's a great great call um everyone you're spoiled you've played with some I'm, really I'm, great I'm players I've, I, I really am i really am um the game that I played the most on the stream of blood when it first started was called um, vampires of Pittsburgh. So and it good. was a vampire, the masquerade campaign. And that was uh, Thomas Middleditch and Ashley Birch and I at the start. And then uh, Thomas took a break and Abu uh, Salim came in and Ashley and he are such, I mean, they are capital a actors. And so when they play a character, 
they ain't going to half-ass it. That's exactly right. <laughs> They're going to really emotionally invest in this avatar of their soul that yep. they have created. Both of them play these those characters with so much integrity. The choices are so true to the character that they've created. They're so emotionally invested in the world that we're all riffing out. And, and they have, the, and because of that, they have the courage to make big yeah. choices uh, that, and that's the big thing for, for, I think for players too, that another thing from improv and acting, it's all about just m- making a big, making a, taking a big swing, making a choice. Um, and very often a big choice doesn't have to be something that you're inventing whole cloth is like the cleverest thing in the world. It's just a choice to react to the last thing that was said. And both of them do that so, so beautifully. Um, they, they're reactive actors. And so that when you bring things up, they make them important. Yep. And that's, that's, that's the best feeling in the world as, a, as an ensemble member. You're being listened to and the things that you're, you're saying are being reacted to with importance. So Ross, one of the big things that I was hoping to get out of this interview was to to understand um, your philosophy as a player. And I think the biggest takeaway I have so far and something I'm going to take with me is this concept that you have brought up several times now of of making the other players feel big, make the other players feel important, make the other players um, feel needed and wanted. Um, I've never heard it phrased quite that way. Um, I think that's phenomenal advice, Ross. Yeah. Like, I mean, I want to be, I want to, as a player, like my desire is like, I want to be a, be somebody both as an, as a improviser and as a player where people walk away from the table being like, Ooh, I really liked playing with that guy. Not as it's not, not like, not like they were the, the best. Right. It's like they were, they were the, they were really supportive. They were of, of me and my choices. And, um, and that's, yeah, exactly. That's precisely it. Um, treat them, treat them with uh, integrity and make their choices really matter. Yeah. When I coach improv, when I direct improv, I, I'll, I'll, if I see two, two green young improvisers doing a scene, the dialogue's going back and forth. Um, I, uh, nice party. Uh, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> my, it's my first uh, time at your house. Thanks. I, I just got the new furniture moved in. Uh, I've never seen a couch like that. Yeah. It's from Ikea. Uh, we're, we're great. And I will, and I'll say like, um, the, that couch is, I've never seen a couch like that before. That's a statement of opinion. Take a Mm. punch, take that punch. Um, whether or not you, you, you interpret it as good or bad, react to that as though it has an emotional impact Mm. and, and that will open up this scene. If you're like, um, interesting, interesting. How I'm sorry. My (laughs) apartment isn't as nice as yours. Jeremy, um, must be nice being regional manager, but the, or or conversely, like, Oh, thank you. Um, it was, it was my mom's, uh, you know, like this could go any, any way, but like, like, It'll deepen. Everything will, will, will deepen. And you don't have to invent a ton if right. you just take the punch, if you just like let yourself be impacted. So much of gaming is about building yourself up an armored character that can't get hurt. Yeah. But you but you as a character have to be vulnerable to the quote unquote punch to, to take it. And when you do that player to player, they will feel supported because you've made their words matter. What's kind of cool to me about that idea, Ross, is that, and you implied this, and I don't know if I, that's my reading of it is it doesn't mean that they meant to punch you and it doesn't mean they were punching exactly. hard, right? It, 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 that, that you can, you can take it and make it a punch and react to it. Like it's one of, did I capture that? Yes, yes, yes. Um, it's so much of improv is all, it's like, it's reacting. You don't, right. you very rarely, you very rarely decide early on. You're, it's not as though I'm deciding to do such and such and such and such and plot this out. No, I decide to the improv, the improvisation comes with my choice to 
react to the thing you did and mm-hmm. read a ton of stuff into the thing that you did a certain way. And, and that's, that's kind of the skill of it. And yeah. then justify why I did that, had that reaction. Um, yeah. Um, be willing to be impacted, be willing to care Great way about to what you're, about what your, uh, your fellow players and your GM are telling you. Oh, that's so cool. So guys, we're going to take one more break. When we get back from this break, we're going to get to what you know is my favorite segment. We have talking about all the things Ross does, all the things that Ross creates and brings to the table. I want to find out what he eats. We'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> Almonds, baby. See you next week. <laughs> Short segment, go! <laughs> Uh, Hey, it's me. Um, I'm interrupting this episode, and I hope you're enjoying it, and I bet you're anxious to hear the rest. But before we jump back, I need a favor. Do you know someone who might enjoy this episode? Can you shoot them a quick message or maybe even send them a link to it? Listeners sharing this podcast was the primary reason we almost doubled our audience last year. Also, would you like to see and hear these games in action? Go to the Third Floor Wars YouTube channel and Twitch stream. Our actual plays combine compelling role-playing, character-driven action, and system tutorials. We create great stories while lifting the hood and showcasing the game mechanics. Links to both are in the show notes. Okay, last thing, and I mean it. Have you rated this podcast on your pod platform yet? Maybe even written a short review? It is a simple way for you to be even more awesome than you already are. Okay, now I'm done. Let's jump back and listen to the rest of this episode. Uh, So, Ross, this has like naturally just become the last segment of all my interviews now because I'm finding that, you know, we can spend a lot of time really discovering your arc as a creative, which I really feel like we have. And but we've talked about it in the, um, the sphere of Ross. Right. And what I'm also finding interesting is what creatives like to consume. So has there been any shows, movies, books, games, or anything that you've come across that has really gotten its hooks into you and not let go recently? Yeah. Um, there's so many things I'm really into at the moment learning about what I've called the mid-century paranoia classics. I don't know what that is. Uh, this is this is maybe a genre of my own sort of like I love coined, it already, coinage. Though. I'm talking Manchurian Candidate. I'm oh talking all the president's men. Oh I'm talking God. the conversation. I'm talking Clute. Um, a couple nights ago, I watched for the first time uh, Bogdanovich's Targets. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a Criterion Channel has a whole. Um, uh, um, collection right now that's all um, mid-century neurotic movies. They have some of those on there. Also, uh, like a uh, sec seconds, oh, um, shock corridor. Um, the the fifties and the sixties are memory siloed. I feel like of this generation in this way, where where it's all like gee whiz and and uh, everything was gee whiz and Mad Men, and then it was hippies and yep. I. Th- but it's so much weirder. It's so much darker. It's so much, um, it's so neurotic and paranoid and it's the genera- it's my parents' generation. So I'm right. kind of like in a way psychoanalyzing my, my, my parents <laughs> as I'm, as I'm watching all this stuff. And, and it's also like the, the fertile ground out of which our era has come. Yeah. And, uh, and there's also a series of books that I've really enjoyed listening to as books on tape by Rick Perlstein, who's a, uh, historian of American politics mm. and he writes about the rise of conservatism in America. The first one is called before the storm. It's about, um, uh, Oh boy. I'm sorry. Uh, I've only listened to the whole book and the name is coming <laughs> to, you can edit all this out. Barry Goldwater, Barry Goldwater. Oh yes. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. The rise of Barry Goldwater. And then he has a book called uh, Nixon land and a book called Reagan land about their respective. Those are the three big pillars. Those are the big, th- big progressions. Yeah. Yeah. And they were totally fascinating to me. So I'm, so I'm now like getting into, I, I want to read more of these kind of like persons of letters, these cultural commentators of that era. So 
I got some Norman Mailer. I got some nice. uh, Gore Vidal. I got some, I'll get some uh, Joan Didion. Like, I just want to, I just want to learn more about that whole c- weird cultural stew, you know? <laughs> Dude, there's such an overlap in our interests. I'm like, like all, everything you're talking about is like so fascinating to me. And, and it's fascinating to me because in the way you phrased it clicks with me because it's, it's, it's the origins, right? Where did this come from? How did we get here? What were the movies that led to our movies? What are the politics that led to our politics? Uh, yeah. I completely, completely get that. Um, I want to tap into the movie thing a little bit because you've mentioned movies that I've only ever heard you, you mention movies mm. that I love that <laughs> like nobody else talks about. I have been trying to, exp- so I, I love different eras of movies, right? So behind me, there's a Casablanca uh, poster, Ooh, yeah. the greatest movie, only perfect movie ever made. I'll die on that hill. When they play La Marseille, I, uh, I cry every time. Yeah. Yep. Just, and, and then there's this next era that you're talking about, which was this weird transition from, from the fifties into the seventies and, and where you had, especially in Europe, you had just these freak people making movies that were make, putting out some scary like Suspiria type shit. Yeah. Right. Um, and then part of that transition, um, I have not been able to explain to people why this is such an interesting part of cinema. And, and, and maybe you can help me, like, can you help me piece together a Mount Rushmore? Um, so if, if someone was just like, Craig, I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. Ross, what are you even talking about? Say, go watch these four movies and then, and then come talk to me. What do you think those four movies might be? Wow. That's what that, that's a, so I'm curating, I'm curating the film festival of, Correct. of, of that For newbies of, for newbies of that era. Yep. Um, talk about like, why, why is this era how it is? Why are, why are we where we are? Mm-hmm. Um, I might, um, I mean, I've mentioned several of them already. That's okay. Let's uh, go back to them. Yeah. Um, Actually, I'll, I'll, here's a new one. I'll throw up. Um, I forget the director, but there's a there's a film noir called Gun Crazy. No idea what this is. Keep talking. Uh, Gu- Gun Crazy is a is a uh, um a film noir about a trick a, about a about a you know in the way that film noirs often are a guy who meets a uh, a a femme fatale <laughs> who's a trick a trick shot in a carnival. Okay, they're both, they're both handy with the steel, if you know what I mean, and they and they just go on a. And they go Bonnie and Clyde. They go, they go shooting and Robin. And it's, and I don't know about paging Dr. Freud. Sometimes a gun is not just a gun, if you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, if you want to talk about like the American sort of obsession with violence and it's the way in which it's repression of sexuality, uh, perversely returns as violence. <laughs> um, uh, gun crazy is right there, but it's still, it's still very much in the fifties to the point that they tack on an ending where it, they really give you a scoldy like, and crime didn't pay oh, for these two. Really interesting. Yeah. Um, um, sixties, um, while we're on the topic of, of, of guns, let's go to the one I just saw targets, which kind of blew my mind. It's, like uh, Quentin Tarantino was clearly watching this and taking notes while he was working up Once Upon a Time in Hollywood because there's a lot of rhyming yep. images. But it's about, it stars Boris Karloff as a version of himself, as a faded uh, monster movie cinema icon who feels out of touch with contemporary society in the late 60s, who even is like, what an ugly town. He, he, Los Angeles doesn't look the same to him anymore. And while we're tracking this sweet old monster in decline, we're also seeing a parallel narrative of a smiling young, young lad of the of the 60s, um, blonde haired and fresh faced, who's uh, collecting an arsenal of weapons to go on a shooting spree. For what reason? We know not. Yet we can suspect many reasons. And these two this this cinema this campy cinema monster of yore and this all too real monster are on a collision course that's that's two um uh the conversation um Francois Coppola's conversation um 
about a paranoid security expert. I don't, I don't need to say more. No, <laughs> and it, It's criminal how many people have not seen that movie. Yeah. Did he make that, did Francis Ford Coppola make that between Godfather 1 and 2? Do, do I have that right? I want to say it's before that, but I could be wrong. I, I, mean, I want yeah. to say that's closer to film school for him, but I could, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I can't remember yet, but it's in, so it's, it's right in that, in that zone. Yeah, Gene Hackman plays a, plays a, a wound <laughs> tight, wonderful character. And it is a, you know, it's one of these movies about the world we live in now yep. where everyone sees your every move and anyone can watch you. And we all carry surveillance devices around in our pockets at all times. Um, so that there's four. <laughs> and so, and, uh, God, I'm going back now to the sixties, but, and I didn't mention this one carnival of souls, which is oh one of my, my favorite. God. You, you brought up Suspiria and carnival of souls is one of my favorite horror movies. Yep. And it's, um, and it has so much, um, mid-century neuroses in it as well. It is about a woman who starts to think that she may not be alive. And, I think there is some commentary in there about like the way in just the role of women the at role that of women. time, yep. Yep. where, where as a, as a, as a person in that society with no, um, agency, mm -hmm. you are in a way trapped between life and death. And, uh, so there's your, there's your, uh, <laughs> feel good. <laughs> Your feel good uh, film fest. I'm behind it, and and I, I need to go back and watch Targets because I haven't watched it in a very very long time. And and you you mentioned it to me in like five images that are just burned into my brain just immediately came up. Um, so honestly, Ross, on a Tuesday night, like you could be doing a lot of cool shit. Like you could be um watching some of the old film classics from like mm -hmm. early Lucas and early Coppola, but instead Ooh. you decided to spend an hour or so with me, and I really appreciate it, man. Oh, appreciate it. This was a great conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And for those of you listening, guess what? <laughs> this is the end. You made it. And I appreciate you doing that. Take care. A really big thank you to Ross for joining me today. You can find out more about their work by following Ross BB on Instagram. Do you think listening is the most important player skill? I'm dying to hear your thoughts. Let me know on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Blue Sky, or drop me a line at admin at thirdfloorwars.com. Don't worry, all those links are in the show notes waiting for you. Please take a minute to rate, review, and share this podcast. You don't want to miss the next episode. I talk with Jonathan Mordek about their storytelling game, The King's Poisoner. Happy gaming, friends. Remember that Pablo Picasso once said, art is the elimination of the unnecessary. Dude, you're good. Oh, you're good. a good guest. <laughs> good, good, good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> good questions. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. All right. Um, That's wild. I didn't know you were in Raleigh. Uh, yeah, isn't that funny? It's so yeah, funny. And, awesome. and now when you said North Carolina, I was like, man, I remember coming across that tidbit. It may have been in your, your interview with on John's channel where oh, that yeah, may yeah, have yeah. came up. And I was just like, oh, no shit, North Carolina. I don't think you specified where in North Carolina, but... Yeah, the OBX. Um, I lived in Waynesboro as a little kid, too. No shit. Isn't that funny? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm originally from the Northeast, uh, but I was like 15, I moved. Uh, my family moved. I didn't move when I was 15. Family <laughs> moved down here. And what I pe tell people about North Carolina is North Carolina is not the best at anything. Doesn't have the best food, doesn't have the best entertainment, doesn't have the best taxes, doesn't have the mm -hmm. best quality of living, but it's mm -hmm. so fucking good at almost everything. Like it's just right above average on everything that I just, I love it here. I think there's a great way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a sleeper hit. Uh, it is. A it's of, a sleeper mm -hmm. hit. And you've got little pieces, right? So you've got Raleigh in the middle, which is what I mm -hmm. love because I can go out to Kill Devil Hills in two hours and go to, you know, go to the mountains in two hours. Yes, yes. But then you've got really neat communities on the East Coast. You've got some really neat communities in the mountains. There's a lot of garbage in between those three <laughs> points, <laughs> but um, it uh, it's good. All right, brother, I'll bring us back. All righty. Doing no time. Okay, on time. We're at about an hour. I think we got about yeah. 30 minutes left. You good? All good. Okay. Great. How do I want to start? Yeah, this, this is time? great. Oh, thanks, man. It, yeah. it means a lot to me. 
All right. How you doing, brother? You all right? Oh, yeah. This is... You got our 10 in you? Uh, yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. We're cooking. We're cooking with Gaius. Beautiful. Hey, are you still here? Look, uh, the podcast is over. And you sat through all of the breaks and bloopers? Well, I mean, if you're here, might as well run over to patreon.com and become a supporter. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast too while you're at it on whatever platform you're listening to. I do appreciate you sticking around. Take care.